So in this podcast, I would like you to try to calculate this integral here, and it's a definite integral. It's an example of an improper integral because we're ex integrating over an infinitely long um, part of the real axis from naught to infinity. Um, and for simplicity, I would suggest that you assume that this parameter a is positive. And calculate the integral, then come back, and on the next slide there's a detailed solution, and then there's comments and a related exercise for you at the end. So try this with pen and paper, and then come back. Okay, welcome back. Let's look at the integral. So let's look at this integral. Now this is a hyperbolic function and it's the function that we pronounce as shine of ax. Now supposing it wasn't a hyperbolic function and it was a trigonometric function, then what we would do is we would use parts, integration by parts, and we would have to use integration by parts twice to find out the value of the integral. And that's something we did in the video that I called Integration Practice 9. But here, although that method would work, it's far too much work. So we should recall the definition of the shine function. All the hyperbolic functions are combinations of exponential functions. So this is the combination which we define to be shine of ax. So it's e to the ax minus e to the minus ax, all divided by 2. So to calculate this integral, it's much easier to substitute this directly into the integrand here. I'm going to take the factor of a half outside to make this look less intimidating. And we have the integral from naught to infinity of this, the numerator, multiplied by e to the minus sx. So in a moment, we're going to multiply this out and we're going to get products of exponential functions and then using the rules for powers, we will just add the arguments of the exponentials. Now, let's also think about the fact that we are integrating here from zero to infinity. And this is, as I said, is an improper integral. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, let's integrate from naught to a finite value and then having calculated the integral, we can take the limit as what happens as b, as I've called it here, approaches infinity. And this is a standard way of tackling improper integrals. And I will show you this pictorially on the next slide. So all we have to do, as said, is we've written out the integration limits this way now as a limit naught is fine, infinity is this limit. And now we have e to the ax times e to the minus sx. So that is e to the a minus s all times x. And then the second term is minus, and it's e to the minus ax times e to the minus sx. So a minus sign comes outside there, open brackets, a plus s, close brackets, both times x. So now we have these two integrals and they're of the same form. It's e to something times x integrated with respect to x. So all we have to do is write 1 over this times the exponential. Let's just verify that. If we differentiate it, we're differentiating with respect to x. The derivative of an exponential is the exponential. And then from the chain rule, you multiply by the derivative of this argument, and that would just be a minus s. You would get rid of the x when you differentiate it. So you'd bring a power of a minus s outside that would cancel with that, and you would obtain this. So if you differentiate that, you obtain that. That shows that this is the correct integral of this factor. And in a very similar way, for this term, we get this. The only thing to be careful here is here there is an overall minus sign. So when you when you differentiate this, you would bring out a minus sign and minus times plus gives you that minus sign that we need here. 
So again, if you look at that, differentiate it, you will obtain this. And this is now to be evaluated between the limits of 0 and b, and then we'll take the limit as b goes to infinity. So let's just expand this. We will first of all write it out at the upper limit. So we just replace x by b here, and then this term, replace x by b here. And then at the lower limit, we put minus and write all of this out at the lower limit. So it's good practice to open a large brackets and then we rewrite all of this with x replaced by 0. But that means we'd have e to the 0 here and e to the 0 here. So what we're using here is just the fact that e to the naught is equal to 1. So therefore, here and here, there is a factor of 1 from the exponentials multiplying them. And I'm not bothering to write that 1 there or there. So now... We have got our answer for the integral written here, for the integral from naught to b. And what we want to think about is what happens in the limit as b approaches infinity. Well, the half is just going to sit there multiplying everything. There is a b dependence here and here, which is not surprising because these terms came from the upper limit of the integral. These terms here do not depend upon b, and they're not going to be changed as we change b. So they're going to be there. Now, here we have e to some constant times b. As b becomes larger and larger, there are two possibilities. If this constant is positive, say here, then what we're doing is we're effectively just multiplying e together more and more times, and that is going to diverge because e is greater than 1. But if this constant is negative, then since a negative power means dividing, we would have here 1 divided by e to some number of times to some so it's 1 over e to a positive power and that means as you increase b you have 1 divided by a larger number of powers of e and this is going to go to 0 so there are essentially two possibilities if the coefficient is negative Something like this will vanish as b goes to infinity. If the coefficient is positive, something like this will diverge as b goes to infinity. If it's diverging, the function is not defined. So we are only interested in when the, the case when these two factors here go to zero. So for this term to go to zero, we need that this power is negative. So we need a minus s to be negative. We need, in other words, s to be larger than a. Remember, I'm assuming for simplicity that a is positive. So we're going to require that s is bigger than a. Notice that that means that this term will also be fine because a is positive. If s is bigger than a, it's positive, And we've got a minus sign times something positive. This, as b gets larger and larger, will approach 0. So all we need is that s is bigger than a for this to make sense, to have a finite value. So as long as s is bigger than a, this will vanish and this will vanish. They will both tend to zero. The half sits there multiplying everything. And then we have these terms, which I've just written out again unchanged. And now what I want to do to tidy the algebra up is to bring the minus sign inside to multiply both of these terms. So here we're going to have minus one over a minus s. And that's got multiple minus signs and is potentially a source of error. So it's much easier to bring the minus sign in for this term and just multiply it into the denominator. 
So instead of having a minus s, I'll write it as s minus a. I'm just multiplying that denominator by minus 1. And so we'd have minus a plus s, which is s minus a. For the other term, both of these parts are positive. So I'm just going to say it's minus times plus is minus. So now we want to put this onto a common denominator. The factor of 2 just sits there. s minus a times s plus a is s squared minus a squared. For the first term, we've multiplied the bottom by s plus a. So we have to multiply the top by s plus a so that this would partly cancel down to give 1 over s minus a. And then for the second term, we have minus. And in the same way, we've multiplied top and bottom by s minus a. So now we see that we can cancel the factors of s here and here. And we are left with a minus minus a. So that's a plus a or 2a. And the 2 and the 2 in the denominator will cancel. And we're going to be left with an a divided by s squared minus a squared. And that's what I've written here. And remember that we require for this integral to converge s to be greater than a. So what we did to calculate this integral was we thought if we were using trigonometric functions, we'd use parts twice, but the shine function, this hyperbolic function, is defined as a combination of exponential factors. So we've just put this definition straight into here, taken the half out. And then before we calculated it, we said, well, instead of integrating from naught to infinity, which is going to mean putting in factors of infinity in, in, in arguments, which is um, hard to understand at best, it's better to say, well, we'll take we'll integrate up to a value called b and then take the limit as b goes to infinity. And doing that, we obtain this, and then we took b to infinity, and we saw that the only way we could get finite answers was by demanding that s had a value greater than a. So if s here is not greater than a, this integral would diverge. If s is greater than a, this is the value of the integral. So on the next slide, I'll just talk a little bit more about some of these steps and what they mean. So this was our integral. This is the result we've obtained. The formula makes sense for any value of s which is not equal to plus or minus a. We don't want to divide by zero. The integral, however, only makes sense if s is greater than a. I'm assuming that a is positive. Were a to be negative, you can convince yourself, if you go through the argumentation of the previous slide, that you will get a finite answer if s is greater than the modulus of a. We can also start to understand why we need s to be bigger than something to make this integral converge by looking at this exponential factor. So what, we, what it's telling us is that we have our integrand as shine of ax divided by e to the sx. That's what that negative power means. So the larger s is, the more you are dividing shine of ax. And this is therefore getting smaller and smaller as x gets larger. So by increasing s, we are suppressing the size of our integrand. And in that way, you can hope to get a finite result and not a divergent one. OK, finally, this type of integral is an example of what's called a Laplace transform. And you can change this function and replace it by lots of other functions. And this is very useful in the calculation of the solutions of differential equations. Just pictorially, 
to talk about the limit one more time. So here is a graph of a function. So let's say that here we've got y is f of x. I'm just looking at some arbitrary function now. This is the integral that we want to calculate. And if our function is positive, which I'm just drawing it here for simplicity, this definite integral is equal to this area that goes on forever. And what we've done is we've said to see if it converges or diverges, we calculate the same thing, but up to a cutoff, which we've called B. And then after calculating the integral, we move B out to the right. And we see then whether it diverges or gives us a finite result. And this is something that is quite common with improper integrals. So on the next, the next slide, the last slide, I'm just going to give you another exercise that you are welcome to look at. So finally, I have here replaced the shine of AX by cosh of AX. I'm again suggesting that you take A to be positive and asking you to calculate that. And what you will obtain is that you get S, this parameter, over S squared minus A squared, but you will also find that this integral only converges if S is greater than A. So that's to allow you to practice what we have done in this video. And with that, I will stop.